Hello and thanks for joining us for today's video. Just before we get started, we want to let you know that we're always looking for new cases for Criminally Listed, plus our other channel, Paranormally Listed, and our podcast, Into the Killing. For Into the Killing, we want to hear about cold cases that were eventually solved. For Paranormally Listed, we love to hear stories about the supernatural. This includes stories about ghosts, hauntings, monsters, mysterious creatures, aliens, UFOs, and even unsolved mysteries that can't be explained. We'd even love to hear about your own experiences with the supernatural. To suggest a case, please visit our website, criminallylisted.com, and then go to the Suggest a Case page. A short time ago, on our sister channel, we did a video about psychics who help solve murders. We want to know what you think about psychics. Are they real? Let us know what you think in the comments section. Speaking of psychics, there's a great documentary series about them on Magellan TV, who is today's sponsor. The series is called Psychic Investigators. The series is about real-life murder cases where investigators became stuck. Then, thanks to people who claimed to have psychic abilities, the cases were solved. Whether you believe in psychic abilities or not, these stories are fascinating and may make you question what you believe. There are 45 episodes of Psychic Investigators, so there's plenty of material to watch. I love Magellan TV because it's a great deal for its price and quality. Many people, including myself, think of it as a hidden gem in the world of streaming. They have a huge selection of documentaries and genres like true crime, science, and history. They have over 3,000 documentaries and 20 hours of new material is added every week. You should check out Magellan TV today because they have a great deal for criminally listed viewers. They are offering our viewers 30 days of free service. To get this amazing offer, just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed. Please check out Magellan TV today because you'll find something great to watch and you'll be supporting criminally listed in the process. Number 3. Richard Wheeler On September 18th, 1984, a construction worker found a body hidden on a wooden property in Noxamixon Township, Pennsylvania. He had been shot four times in the chest and the head. The medical examiner thought he had been dead for up to 10 days. The body was identified as 34-year-old Richard Wesley Wheeler. Wheeler had a criminal record. He had been convicted of dealing marijuana in California. He then escaped from prison. He was recaptured and then he was sent to the Danbury Federal Prison in Danbury, Connecticut. He was released in November 1979, less than a year before he was murdered. The police investigated the murder for years. In 1983, they learned from a witness that Wheeler was murdered on the orders of a man named Leslie Schmidt. In 1980, at the time of the murder, Schmidt was 39 years old. Schmidt was a meth dealer and he met Wheeler in prison. In late 1979, Schmidt was on a 30-day furlough from prison. He connected with Wheeler. He set Wheeler up on a property with a camper in a meth lab. Schmidt gave Wheeler $250,000 and told him to use the money to take care of Schmidt's family while he served out the rest of his sentence. He also wanted Wheeler to run the meth lab. Schmidt funded the lab while he was still in prison. But then at some point Schmidt got angry with Wheeler because he thought that Wheeler was spending the quarter of a million dollars on himself instead of Schmidt's family. So he arranged for Wheeler to be killed. The witness said that Schmidt had, quote, a German guy pull the trigger, unquote. Also, the witness said that Schmidt met the German man in prison. The police thought it was a German national named Peter Eric Marschner. He was nicknamed the captain because he used to steal yachts and boating equipment in the Caribbean islands. In May 1974, Marshner was sentenced to two years in prison for stealing a sailboat in Martinique. He was supposed to be deported after he was released, but he got a job on a private yacht and made his way to the Caribbean islands. In February 1977, he stole a yacht, $10,000 worth of boating equipment and some money from a port in St. Lucia. A month later, he stole another boat. This time, it was from a harbor in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. In May 1977, he was arrested by French authorities. He was then extradited to the United States to face charges over the boat he stole in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He pleaded guilty to grand larceny and interstate transport of stolen goods. He was sent to Danbury Federal Prison to serve his sentence. 
In July 1980, he was released. He was supposed to be deported to Germany. He was brought to the airport, but he managed to escape. After that, he went to Knox and Mixon Township, where he hooked up with Wheeler. He became his bodyguard and driver. But then he got the order from Schmidt to kill Wheeler, so he shot him to death. The Marchner disappeared. So while the police thought they knew who killed Wheeler, they couldn't prove it. There was also another mystery. What happened to Peter Marchner? Did Schmidt have him killed to silence him after he killed Wheeler? If so, what happened to his body? Also, who was the person who killed him? With so many questions, no arrests were made in the case, and it went cold. Over 42 years went by. Then in 2023, the police reopened the case. They knew the key to solving the case was finding the trigger man, Peter Marshner. Somehow, the police learned that he had been arrested in New York on drug conspiracy charges two years after the murder. But he gave the name Charles McLaren. McLaren had a different social security number and birth date for Marshner. The cold case investigators got McLaren's fingerprints from his 1982 arrest. They compared his fingerprints to Marshner's fingerprints, and it was a match. After he was released for the drug conspiracy charges, he moved to New Jersey. He got married and had children. He also started a successful limousine company in New York City. He died in 2006. His family had no idea he had a criminal past. The police wanted to talk to Charles Smith, but they couldn't. He had died a year earlier, in April 2022, at the age of 80. According to his obituary, he had five daughters, one stepdaughter, 24 grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. The police concluded that since all the parties involved in the murder were dead, they could officially close the case. In early 2023, the police let Richard Wheeler's family know that Peter Marshner had killed him on the orders of Charles Schmidt. Number 2. Carol Sue Kleber In June 1976, Carol Sue Kleber was 16 years old. She lived with her mother and two older brothers in Fort Wright, Kentucky. Her father had died six years earlier from a heart ailment. Carol loved music. She started playing the piano when she was five. She also played guitar and in high school she started learning the violin. She had been a brownie and a Girl Scout. She also volunteered as a candy striper at a local nursing home. On June 4, 1976, Carol went out riding her bike. She returned a few hours later in a two-toned car being driven by a young man. Carol got her bike out of the trunk. She went inside her house and changed her clothes. The young man turned the car around and sat in the car. Carol told her family she was going to dinner with friends at Cincinnati, Ohio restaurant. Cincinnati is about five miles from her home, but she didn't tell her family who was driving her. Carol then got in the car and they drove off. About 14 hours later, her body was found in a roadside ditch. She was nude from the waist down. She had been struck in the head seven times with something like a tire iron. She had also been strangled with a chain necklace she wore. She had been sexually assaulted. The police thought she was killed elsewhere and then dumped on the side of the road. Unfortunately, the police made no arrest in the days after the murder. The police released a sketch of the young man with a two-tone car that was seen with Carol on the night she was killed. But once again, no arrests were made. The case went cold. One detective became obsessed with the case and vowed to solve it. He came up with two suspects. The detective died in September 2017. The Boone County Sheriff's Office started a cold case unit that same year. Two detectives began to investigate Carol's murder. They had a sample of the killer's DNA and a profile was made. They got DNA samples from the two men the detective considered to be the prime suspects. The DNA results cleared both men as suspects. In September 2022, 
They sent the DNA profile to Orthrum Inc., a DNA laboratory in Woodland, Texas. They performed genetic genealogy on the DNA. They found a child of the killer. The police talked to that person who didn't know their father well and they volunteered a sample of their DNA. Othram was able to confirm that the killer was their father. His name was Thomas Dunaway. He was 19 when Carol was killed. He didn't live far from Carol and they both lived in the same school district. He lived half a mile away from a park where Carol often rode her bike. In May 1976, months before the murder, Dunaway purchased a two-toned 1973 Chevrolet Monte Carlo. He also looked a lot like the sketch. Nine days after the murder, he enlisted in the army. He was sent to Fort Carson, Colorado, and he got rid of his car. On December 17, 1976, about six months after Carol's murder, 19-year-old Ronald Townsend was found bleeding on the side of the road about six miles away from where Carol's body was found. Townsend had been shot several times. He was taken to the hospital, but died four days later. At the time of Townsend's murder, Dunaway was AWOL from the army. He was arrested for the murder, and he confessed. In 1977, he pleaded guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. However, he was released after seven and a half years for reasons that were never made clear. Dunaway could not be charged with Carol's murder because he died in 1990 at the age of 33. The cause of death was not made public. In March 2023, the police informed Carol's family that the case had been solved. Thomas Kleber was 18 when his sister was murdered, and he was the one who identified her body. He said it's a relief to have answers, but even after 43 years, he is still angry about his sister's murder. He told the New York Times, I wish I had known in 1990. What do you say after all this time? I had some rather unchristian plans for him. The police plan to exhume Thomas Dunaway's body so they can get a DNA sample so it can be entered into the FBI's combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS. Only DNA taken from direct sources can be added to CODIS. The police want to see if Thomas Dunaway committed any other murders. Number 1. Patricia Carahan On September 28, 1979, three men were in a picnic area in Sugar Pine Point State Park in Lake Tahoe, California. On the shore of Lake Tahoe, they came across a woman who had been badly beaten and raped. The men didn't call the police or an ambulance. Instead, they called a newspaper reporter who in turn called the police. When the police arrived, the woman was dead. The police believed that the woman was alive when the men found her. The police found the woman's flip-flop in the picnic area. They believed that the killer chased her through the picnic area. He caught up to her on the lakeshore and they raped her, then beat her and strangled her to death. The woman had no ID on her and the police could not identify her. The police talked to the three men who found her and asked why they didn't call the police. They said they all had warrants and didn't want to get into trouble. The police couldn't connect them to the murder, so they weren't charged. Without identification, the woman was buried under the head marker, unknown female, Tahoma, 9-79. They thought the woman was between 35 and 45 years old. She was 5 foot 2 to 5 foot 4 and weighed 115 to 130 pounds. She had shoulder length wavy dark brown hair with gray streaks and brown eyes. She also had some unique jewelry. This included a gold wedding band inscribed with to Mac from PNB and a pendant that resembled a deer. But no one came forward in the ensuing decades. In 2014, a cold case investigator was assigned to the case. He had the body exhumed. She had been buried with her jewelry. The police had the jewelry photographed. When he saw the necklace that looked like a deer pendant, he recognized it. Elvis Presley used to wear one. But it wasn't a deer. 
It was a chai side, which is the Jewish side for life. So the investigators distributed the photos of the jewelry to Jewish newspapers. A 61-year-old woman saw the photographs and thought it might belong to her mother. Her mother went missing in 1979 while on a solo trip to California. She was heading home when she went missing. Her family reported her missing in her home state of Virginia in October 1979. The daughter gave the cold case investigators a DNA sample. In 2015, they confirmed that the murdered woman was 35-year-old Patricia Carahan. She had driven to California in her van. Her van had been found abandoned in a car lot in Venice, California. At the time, the police had no reason to suspect that the van belonged to the Jane Doe. South Lake Tahoe and Venice are nearly 440 miles from each other. After 36 years, one major aspect of the case was solved. The victim had been identified. But who killed 35-year-old Patricia Carahan? DNA was collected from the autopsy and a profile was created. A beer bottle had also been found near the body. DNA was found on the beer bottle and it was compared to the DNA from the autopsy. It was a match. The first people the DNA was compared to were the three men who found Carahan. None of them were a match. So the police entered the DNA into CODIS. But no match was found. In 2020, the DNA profile was added to the Ancestry database 23andMe, but it didn't turn up any leads. Then February 2023, the police were notified that a match the DNA had been found in CODIS. About six years earlier, Washington State started the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative to try to eliminate its backlog of sexual assault kits. In 1994, a homeless woman who lived in Spokane accused a man named Harold Carpenter of raping her. Carpenter was arrested and a sample of his DNA was taken. The next day, Carpenter was released. Then the woman disappeared. When the police finally located the woman years later, they learned she had died. So the district attorney never pursued the charges against Carpenter. But the police kept Carpenter's DNA. It sat in a warehouse for 19 years. Then, thanks to the Sexual Assault Kid initiative, it was uploaded to CODIS in February 2023 and it was linked to the murder of Patricia Carahan. At the time of the murder, Carpenter was 19 years old. The police were also able to place Carpenter in California at the time of the murder. The day after the murder, Carpenter was arrested on suspicion of driving under the influence in Susanville, California. Carpenter had many run-ins with the law after the murder. In the early 1990s, he was living in Idaho and he was arrested several times for misdemeanor crimes. In the latter part of the 1990s, he and his wife moved to Sandpoint, Washington. In 1998, he was convicted of domestic battery. His wife divorced him that year. Over the next 10 years, he racked up several charges, including reckless driving, driving under the influence, disturbing the peace, and possession of drugs. But none of the crimes were serious enough for the police to collect a sample of his DNA. In 2018, he was a suspect in a rape case, but he was arrested. Between 2016 and 2020, he was homeless. He moved into a building for older people with low income in 2020. In 2022, he was once again a suspect in a criminal case. This time, he was suspected of unwanted sexual touching. But once again, he was not arrested. On March 1st, 2023, 63-year-old Harold Carpenter was arrested for the murder of Patricia Carahan over 43 years after it was committed. At the time of this video, he is waiting to be extradited to California. Harold Carpenter is considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.